Uh, it's a fine night here in Mid Wales. Um, I'm sure some of you will be able to hear the blackbirds and the rooks. This evening uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, a very interesting aspect of Taliesin's myth um, and that is um, the question of who wrote the book of Taliesin. Now for those of you who've been following uh, the Taliesin Origins course and who have been following uh, some of these uh, Tuesday talks, you'll know that there isn't just one answer to this question. There is never just one answer to any of the questions I usually try and answer. Um, we know that the Book of Taliesin, of course, was copied down around 1325, probably by a professional scribe. That scribe was almost certainly either copying an earlier compilation, which is now lost to us, or actually putting together the compilation that we know as the Book of Taliesin. And of course, the Book of Taliesin contains the historical poems, as I described uh, some weeks back now in the session on the Book of Taliesin. The historical poems, which may have been composed by the historical Taliesin back in the 6th century. Difficult to prove that. Uh, beyond uh, a reasonable doubt, but that could be the case. Then we have some miscellaneous verse, mostly religious, not really that interesting. And then we have the legendary poems. The legendary poems, of course, are the poems that I generally deal with on my courses because they're very closely associated to uh, Welsh mythology at its purest in the medieval period. Uh, and they're also closely related to the four branches of the Mabinogi. Several of the legendary poems make reference to episodes in the four branches, which of course makes it interesting for me as someone who generally runs courses on the four branches. We can say that the miscellaneous religious poems were probably composed by minor bards. There's nothing particularly of note in those poems. But the legendary poems, we don't know who wrote all of them, but we can guess at who wrote some of them and who perhaps wrote the more interesting of these legendary poems. Now, this is a theory that was put forward by uh, Professor Margaret Haycock back in 2007 when she first published her legendary poems from the Book of Taliesin. Now, Margaret Haycock doesn't necessarily argue that this poet that we're going to talk about this evening was necessarily the author of some of the more popularly known legendary poems in the Book of Taliesin, but that he at least was very close to these poems. She showed that there was a similarity between some of the legendary poems and some of this court bard's more formal court poetry. That is, there were similar word combinations uh, and similar phrases, if you like, used by this court bard uh, and also used in the legendary poems. So either this court bard had unique access to these poems from the Book of Taliesin and absorbed their influence, but that's kind of doubtful, or this court bard inherited Taliesin uh, material, legendary Taliesin poems, and reworked them uh, according to his own style, according to his own inspiration, or he was actually the originator, he was actually the author of these poems, that he alone composed this work. So who was this poet who could have composed or at least reworked uh, these very famous poems that have come down to us in the Book of Taliesin? Well, it's quite likely that it was a chap called Llawarcha Llywelyn, also known as Prydydd the Moch, or the Poet of the Pigs. To begin with uh, his bardic nom de plume, Poet of the Pigs, we don't know why he had this name. Now, it could be in reference to some of his poems, where he does, for example, in one poem, talk about casting pearls before swine, which would have been a very challenging and aggressive thing to say to a patron 
essentially making out that his poetry was like pearls being cast before the swine of the court. Or he may have been a swineherd earlier in his life. Some people believe that Prydydd the Moch was actually uh, of common birth, that he wasn't from uh, a noble family, he wasn't from a free family, and that it's quite likely that because he comes from this poor background, he may well have been a swineherd, or maybe his family were specifically associated with breeding pigs. We don't know, these are just theories, but we'll dip a little bit more into this idea of Prydydd the Moch Llewarchap Llewelyn being of common birth uh, later on. Llewarchap Llewelyn was alive in the middle of the 12th century, so we can generally date some of these poems from the Book of Taliesin to this period. Now it's believed that Llewarchap Llewelyn either reworked or actually composed poems such as Cad Gothai, The Battle of the Trees, perhaps one of the most famous poems from the Book of Taliesin, made famous, of course, by Robert Graves in his book The White Goddess. That could well have been the original work of Prydydd the Moch. Also Angar Cavindaud, the other very, very long poem in the Book of Taliesin, perhaps one of the more mystical poems we have in the manuscript. Gullachavi Gilwith, again, uh, has many allusions to the mystical culture of the medieval Welsh bards, as does Catair Ceridwen, the chair or the song of Ceridwen. And it's quite likely that Pradidh Amor was not only involved in creating or refashioning these poems, but was almost certainly involved in performing them also. Even though we find poetry of this period written in manuscript, it was almost certainly performed publicly, at least once by the bard themselves, and perhaps then several times after that by their apprentices and declaimers, uh, professional poetry performers essentially, who would keep renowned and famous poems alive by performing them at different court occasions. So these are publicly performed poems, which is interesting because these poems that Pradid Amor composed are of course composed in the first person, and not only composed in the first person, but they're composed in the voice of the legendary Taliesin, which means that Pradid Amor, when he performed these poems, would have performed them in the persona, the dramatic persona of the legendary Taliesin. Now, this is very interesting for several reasons. Prydydd the Moch was not only a poet, he was perhaps the highest ranking poet of his time. Prydydd the Moch uh, is certainly one of the most important poets of this period, which is generally known as the Gogunbeard period. The greatest poet of this period was Kinvelo Prydydd Mawr, and Kinvelo may have been Prydydd the Moch's tutor. So Prydydd the Moch may have been apprenticed to Kinvelo Prydydd Mawr, the greatest poet of this period. So this is not only one of the more popularly known poets of this period, but during his lifetime, particularly at the height of his powers, probably the highest ranking court bard throughout the whole of Wales, because he was chief bard, to none other than Llewellyn the Great. Llewellyn the Great, as his name suggests, was one of the greatest kings amongst the Welsh. Um, he succeeded in uniting Wales. His grandfather was another very famous Welsh king by the name of Owain Gwynedd. And Owain Gwynedd was perhaps one of the first to really unite large portions of Wales. After his death, his kingdom fell into... Not total ruin, but certainly disintegrated into smaller kingdoms once again. And his grandson, Llewellyn the Great, Llewellyn Vaur, succeeded in uniting it once again. And his chief bard was Prydydd the Moch. Which means that in the most important court of the land, Taliesin's myth 
was very likely considered to be part of high court entertainment. It was part of the culture of Wales at the highest aristocratic levels. Entertainment, absolutely, but entertainment of a particular nature. Uh, those of you who have sat several of my courses, particularly the ones related to Taliesin, will know that even though the poetry, the legendary poetry now that we find in the book of Taliesin is very entertaining in many ways, it's very fast paced, it has these very quick turns of meaning, it also does carry some symbolic weight. It is symbolically profound at times. It does give insight into what we could call the mystical underbelly of the Welsh Bardic tradition. As perhaps we might expect from the most important court bard of his time. I'm going to spend this session just showing you how the Taliesin persona is really almost identical to Prydydd the Moch's public persona. So the Taliesin persona that we find in the legendary poems from the Book of Taliesin is almost identical to the dramatic persona that we find in Prydydd the Moch's formal court poetry, the court poetry that he composed uh, in praise of kings uh, such as Llewellyn the Great, and also um, in praise and sometimes satirising and threatening lower nobles. Uh, Prydydd the Moch was one of the few bards who have left these threatening satirical poems, not satirical in the sense that he was necessarily making fun of uh, these lesser nobles, but certainly satirising them in the sense that he was going to bring them great shame because they had displeased him in some way, really revealing the great power and authority uh, of a high-ranking court bard such as Prydydd Moch at this time. So Prydydd Moch was really associated with the royal lineage of Gwynedd that you can see there in the north and northwest of Wales. Gwynedd was almost always considered perhaps supreme the, the dynasty of Gwynedd always claimed a right to rule the whole of Wales. They never always succeeded in that, of course. Wales, like many other uh, cultures and societies at this time, was uh, very fractious, lots of infighting, lots of power struggles. Next door to Gwynedd, you had Powys, stretching down the south to the smaller kingdoms of Brycheiniog, Morganog and Gwent. Uh, and then you had the Heibarth, essentially made up of mostly of David and Ceredigion, quite an important kingdom, uh, one of the most important kingdoms at certain times. So Gwynedd was almost always considered a united territory. And Prydydd the Moch, in his praise poetry to the nobility, to the royal lineage of Gwynedd, always really talks of that kingdom as one distinct territory. And that's interesting because he also praised different nobles in the lineage of Gwynedd who were competing against each other. So Owain Gwynedd dies in the first half of the 12th century. Uh, and Owen Gwynedd, as I said, was a very important and powerful uh, Welsh king of Gwynedd who succeeded in un uniting some of the other Welsh kingdoms. And after his death, his children sort of fell back into the Welsh custom of familial infighting. No one could quite agree on who uh, the king should be. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of competition for the throne of Gwynedd because the throne of Gwynedd then itself gave access to this greater um, uh, right to rule the whole of Wales. Now, throughout the second half of the 12th century, Prydydd the Moch was praising the different nobles who were competing for the throne of Gwynedd. But even though he praised nobles who were uh, often fighting each other and trying to kill each other, he would always praise them uh, as lineages of a one united Gwynedd. Uh, 
And when Llewellyn the Great ascended to the throne at the end of the 12th century uh, and succeeds in not only uniting Gwynedd, but over the, uh, the following decades, the early decades of the 13th century, then goes on to, to unite the rest of Wales, essentially, uh, into one kingdom, Prydydd was there as his chief bard. So Prydydd witnesses not only the the uniting of Gwynedd but also the uniting of Wales this steadily growing power in Wales was witnessed uniquely by Prydydd who had of course unique access to this history he saw it all unfolding before him he not only saw the uniting of Gwynedd and the uniting of Wales he really saw the ascendancy of perhaps the greatest king Wales has ever seen. This chimes quite well with the Taliesin mythology, of course. For those of you familiar with how I often describe this mythology, you'll know that one of the basic dynamics in the Taliesin myth is this relationship between the, the wise counsellor and the courageous king. The heroic king, we could imagine, uh, the, the example I often use is King Arthur, and the wise counsellor is often some kind of Merlin figure. That dynamic, as I often explain, is of course something that's innate to the Welsh Bardic tradition. It's part of the mythology that the Welsh Bards are trying to promote. So this idea not only of the bard as giving political counsel, but also giving spiritual counsel uh, and spiritual wisdom. Uh, this role as the, the chief architect of the king's uh, cultural life, if you like, and spiritual life. Now, in many ways, that mythology is realised, we can assume, in this relationship between Prydydd the Moch and Llywelyn the Great. We don't really know what role Prydydd the Moch played in the ascent of Llywelyn the Great. Um, we're not sure if Prydydd the Moch was ever Llywelyn the Great's tutor. We're not sure when they ever came across each other. But as Llywelyn the Great's chief bard, as the most important bard at the court, he almost certainly would have uh, acted as an ambassador as an advocate, perhaps in legal proceedings, uh, as someone carrying important messages, perhaps even as someone giving counsel. And it may be the authority that Prydydd the Moch derived from that role that Prydydd the Moch carries into these other interesting poems that we find in manuscript, where Prydydd the Moch is threatening minor nobles. We're going to look at some of these poems now in a minute. But it's, it's a very interesting story that we can imagine Prydydd the Moch actually realising the Taliesin myth in his own day. There's not only that historical connection to the Taliesin myth, but there's also this idea that Prydydd the Moch was himself, as I mentioned in the beginning, someone from a common background. We don't have his lineage, but there are hints and, and quite strong suggestions at times that he was of common birth, that he was someone who rose up through the classes, the, the social classes in Wales. Perhaps he was uh, lucky enough to be working for Kindelo Bradith Maur, perhaps as a, a servant or perhaps for whatever reason, uh, he was fortunate enough to be spotted for some particular talent or skill that he had and taken on as an apprentice bard, which then gives him this uh, access to the highest ranks of Welsh society. That's also something that we find in the Taliesin story, uh, in the folktale of Taliesin uh, that was probably quite common at this period. We can't prove that. Uh, but the version that we have copied several hundred years after Prydydd the Moch's time could well have been, or versions of it, or s similar types of story to it, may have been quite popular at the time. And part of that story is, of course, that Gwion Bach is the commonest boy around. 
He's not of any particularly uh, special lineage, and yet he becomes the greatest poet in the land and succeeds in his incarnation as Taliesin to serve his patron well, to be a, a great guide and a great source of wisdom uh, and a great uh, someone of great political benefit to his patron Elfin at that time. So there are these perhaps analogues between the Taliesin folktale and the Taliesin mythology and what actually happened to Prydydd in his lifetime. We don't really know much about Prydydd We can only speculate what happened to him and what his story was. But from what we can speculate, there are these basic similarities with the Taliesin story and the Taliesin mythology. So that's the first interesting thing. But to move on to the poetry itself, I'm just going to look at some of Pradidamor's formal court poetry and compare it to some instances in the Book of Taliesin. I'm not necessarily going to compare Pradidamor's court poetry with the poetry he may have been associated with in the Book of Taliesin. I'll talk a bit more about why later, but it's important to realise that the Taliesin persona was almost certainly something that was common in Welsh culture, or at least the Taliesin mythology was common in Welsh culture. It wasn't invented uniquely by Prydydd Moch. This is an excerpt from one of the praise poems that Prydydd Moch composed to Llywelyn the Great. And it's actually quite a long poem. I'll read you some of the Welsh so you can hear it. Um, this is, of course, classical Welsh poetry. So it's composed um, not only for the meaning, but also for its sound. So it's composed in a way so as to be appealing to the ear. It has lots of musical effects, which uh, I'm going to encourage you to listen out for as I read out the Welsh. Dagoch llawr dwyga dfawr varan. So there you can see there's alliteration between dagoch and dwygad, and there's internal rhyme between llawr and fawr, and then further alliteration between fawr and varan. Dagoch llawr dwyga dfawr varan, un am fro alun elfydd can a Frank, and frawdys fel camlan which translates as the earth reddened in two battles of great wrath, one in the region of Alin, the bright land with Normans, fierce like Camlan. Now, for those of you who are up on your Arthurian references, Camlan is, of course, perhaps in the pseudo history associated with Arthur, uh, the battle where Arthur and Mordred fell. So we have perhaps this earliest of references to perhaps a historical Arthur, although historians by today are very dubious of this referring to anything historically real. But we have the Battle of Camlan in which Arthur and Medraud fell. Medraud, of course, is the original Welsh for what becomes Mordred uh, in the later European tradition. And this is from the Annales Cambriae, um, written in the 10th century. This is... A very general point but it's an important point and that is that as I often say the Welsh court bards were involved in myth making they were highly skilled poets uh, and took on lots of other roles of course in the Welsh in the Welsh court but their main job was to create the mythology of the aristocracy and they did that by doing things like this by comparing their mortal patrons with legendary heroes, uh, legendary heroes who evoked uh, a mythology, the mythology of aristocracy, the mythology of the great warrior king. Camlan is known as a, a fierce and bloody battle in the Welsh tradition. Uh, there are several medieval Welsh texts that refer to Camlan as being one of the greatest battles ever fought. And here, Prydydd the Moch is comparing his own patron, Llywelyn the Great, to the legendary Arthur, or the, the sort of the fictitious Arthur, let's say, and in that way evoking this aristocratic mythology. So that's the first thing. 
And of course, we find this in uh, the book of Taliesin. The book of Taliesin is riddled with these types of references. Then we have another praise poem, this time praising Griffith ab Cunan, who uh, was related to uh, Llewellyn the Great, was one of the contenders for the throne of Gwynedd. Again, I'm going to read the Welsh for you, and please do try and listen out for these sound effects, this alliteration, these repeating consonants and the internal rhymes, uh, and the end rhymes as well. Rhag rhoi dy ganwy dy gynwyre, glyw o fôn hyd fynyw llyw llyang dde, dyrydd i dorf dyre o'r wyddawr, hyd y llewych llawr gwawr gwymp fore. Dy chymysg eir ffysg yn airfle, aistyr a'i gleddu fflamddyr a'i glod dyre. Mab medel itgyr yn heir yn dy he, griffydd teirnydd ti delise. Mab cor ddor dewre ddef dwyre, prifgad megis eu hendad o'i rad odre. Which translates as, Before the Lord of De Ganwy, a battalion arises. De Ganwy overlooks the Conwy estuary. The Conwy River and the Conwy estuary is associated with Taliesin. There is a version of his folk tale where Taliesin is washed up in a coracle on the Conwy estuary. Lord of a compact force from Anglesey to Monmouth, he gives to the retinue passionate steeds as far as the dawn lights the splendid earth's morn. Lovely line there. He excites the tumult of battle where the iron of shields meet. He lifts his sword with a flaming blade and his fame arises. I'm going to talk a bit more about this flaming blade and arising fame in a minute now. He disperses the descendants of murderers, those with trumpets and rough weapons. Griffith, regal lord of the land of Elisa, descendant of a lineage stout as a protecting door. So that's the, the lineage of Gwynedd, uh, his grandfather, of course, being Owain Gwynedd. He who musters the best battalion, like his grandfather, Owain Gwynedd, in his committed charge. So one of the things that's going on there is the court bard not only giving this great heroic portrayal of his patron, but also seeing his patron as an embodiment of his grandfather, Owain Gwynedd. And this does several things. It not only confirms Griffith, in this case, as someone who has a right to the throne of Gwynedd through being descended from Owen Gwynedd, it also mythologizes his grandfather. By referring to Owen Gwynedd in this way, Prydydd the Moch is mythologizing the Gwynedd lineage. He's creating a great hero uh, of Griffith's grandfather and seeing Griffith as an embodiment of that great hero. In many ways, Griffith is not only embodying his ancestor, he's also embodying the aristocratic myth. Prydydd the Moch is dressing Griffith in the mantle of the great hero, who is the rightful heir to the throne of Gwynedd. So you can see how there, there are these different mythological strands being brought into play here. They're all being woven into this public performance of praise. So Prydydd the Moch would have stood up in front of the court and performed this long poem. Now, of course, if you look in the middle of the poem there, you remember I mentioned the flaming blade. He lifts his sword with a flaming blade and his fame arises. Well, of course, there is a flaming blade in Welsh medieval culture, a legendary flaming blade, which is the first of the 13 treasures of the island of Britain. The 13 treasures are a list of magical items um, such as cauldrons and uh, cloaks. And here we have a, uh, a sword, Darnwyn, white hilt, the sword of Hrotherch the Generous. If a well-born man drew it himself, it burst into flame from its hilt to its tip. 
So here, Prada the Moch again evoking a legendary figure, Prada the Generous, but evoking the mythology that's associated with this legendary figure. Just to distinguish what I mean by legend and myth here, legend, of course, is a fictional account which is based in some historical reality. So Rhyderch the Generous was almost certainly a real nobleman. We can't prove that, but it's quite likely that he was. And as his fame grew in his lifetime, after his death, that fame lasts. And different uh, stories and folk stories uh, and narratives are accumulated around this legendary figure, thereby giving us the legend of Rhyderch the Generous. And myth here, I'm using to refer to the underlying ethos, the values and standards of behaviour, the morality, if you like, uh, the moral code that's uh, evoked in this image uh, of the legendary hero, the ideal hero, if you like. So once again, we have Pradidamoch mythologising, acting as a myth-maker, uh, making sure that his patron is larger than life, uh, is an embodiment of a greater set of cultural values. Now, this is an excerpt from one of the threatening poems. So David Aboine wasn't a minor nobleman by any stretch of the imagination, but was certainly not high enough on the aristocratic ladder to cause much of a problem to Prady the Moch. Prady the Moch obviously feeling comfortable enough threatening David Aboine, essentially having a go at him for hiring some scruffy buskers. The court bards were very jealous of their position and they really monopolised the role of the bard through their guilds. And they didn't like bards outside of their own guilds uh, being employed in the different courts. And David, of course, has employed someone uh, or employed a series of bards not associated with the guild. Your praise shines forth when it is announced publicly through the power of my verse skill, as well as my inspired excitement, this fiery awen. Which basically means that I can make you famous through my supernatural powers of fiery awen uh, and my great skill as a bard. But I saw stuttering bards, this is no falsehood, exciter of enemies, recounting your bravery, these bards who are not in the guild, these unofficial bards. I sang your praise differently to how they sang it, powerful soldier, mighty king. So even though he's praising him, he's also having a go at him for employing these buskers, basically. Now, this is something that's an integral part of the Taliesin persona in the legendary poems. If we just look very quickly at an excerpt from Biarth Beirth, the Taliesin persona now says, I am not a stunned poet, I don't falter. When singers sing their songs near me, they'll not create a better splash than me. So the Taliesin, the legendary Taliesin now, positioning himself in contest with other bards, just as Prady the Moor is doing um, uh, in his poem. There's also uh, this excerpt from another threatening, this time of Griffith Ab Canaan. Heaven's maintainer, raise up my abilities. Lord God, you are born a man. So talking to God now, uh, evoking the Christian God directly. Hear my plea for a gift. That is the gift of Awen. If my song issues forth from your blessing, from your message. So essentially calling on God to give him Awen. Do not leave me, generous Lord, who is in possession of sanctity, nor let me leave you. With my turn of phrase, through your grace was I made. So you, your grace is what makes me a bard. Its light persists about a person. So this idea that the Christian God bestows a grace. I know there are different theological arguments about the exact relationship between grace and God, but let's say that a grace is conferred by God. And Prady the Moch says that it, it gives him a certain glow that he shines, it gives him a special aura. The grace of God 
has this tangible divine supernatural effect upon him and of course that's very similar to the notion of awen uh, in the book of taliesin where we just need to look at this beginning to map gavre taliesin i entreat my lord that i may consider inspiration just one of many instances of the legendary taliesin calling on god for awen and of course awen in the book of taliesin is portrayed as this elemental power something that's active in the world something that has a tangible supernatural effect not that dissimilar to this glow uh, that pradi the moch is describing uh, in that poem then there's this excerpt from the praise of rodri abowain i was bestowed with visions on one short occasion beyond the ability of grown men and young boys now of course in several places in the book of Taliesin there's this notion of a visionary bard and there's one reference also to the dreaming bard having secret knowledge we're not sure if this is a dream that's been spoken of here but it certainly inspired awen fueled visions i was bestowed with visions on one short occasion beyond the ability of grown men and young boys i saw a multitude of clamorous bards praising rodri chief of braves they sang that they couldn't find him in what way do they insult other than through total wickedness so this idea of the great visions that that pradidamoch has through his gift of awen these great visions of an alternative reality it's very similar to this notion of prophecy something of course that's mentioned in the book of taliesin we have these visions of prophecy priv gavarch gelvid here from among the leaders there shall emerge a master strategist against the fierce sea rovers will be ranged the seaborn britons they shall prophesy and reap the scattered soldiers around the river seven essentially the legendary persona uh, relating the visions that he's had so again this great similarity between pradidamoch's activities as a court bard and the activities of the legendary taliesin as we find them in the book of taliesin so pradidamoch may not have written the whole of the book of taliesin but he certainly wrote perhaps the most important poems that we find there and it's probably worth finishing with the notion that the persona of taliesin that we find in the book of taliesin was almost identical to the persona of pradidamoch that we find in the formal court poetry in many ways pradidamoch was the legendary taliesin as i speculated at the very beginning not only in what he accomplished during his lifetime but also in his persona in the way that he performed in the different uh, superpowers that he claimed for himself in the ways that he approached his patrons taliesin in the book of taliesin is of course a very bold sometimes arrogant character uh, fearless always in contest with other bards very proud before the court just like pradidamoch and that says a lot about the aristocratic culture of this time that the taliesin myth was not just common amongst the common folk but that it seemed to embody a very important mythology for the welsh aristocracy that it was not only part of welsh bardic mysticism but that it was a central aspect of this high culture it really was the classical culture of the gogunveird period as far as we can tell now of course i'm just guessing in many ways once again as with many of the things i talk about i could never prove this one way or another but i think it's very interesting that that there is this great similarity between the historical poetry of pradidamoch and the legendary poems that we find in the book of taliesin